Alhamdulillah, we had reached Ayah 59 of Surah Al-Qasas, the 28th Surah. So we are moving on from that portion. Imam al he says about Ayah 59, quote, And when the Exalted One says, And we never destroyed a nation, your Lord is not the destroyer of any nation until he sends among that nation a messenger reciting upon them our signs. And we do not destroy any city or town except while the people are committing their oppression therein. The expression, your Lord is not the destroyer of any city, meaning any unbelieving city, with unbelieving people until a messenger is sent in that nation. A messenger, in this case, being sent to the nation's leaders to tell them. Because the messenger has been sent to the most honorable and great of that nation, meaning their kings. And they live in those areas which are around that nation and they are in charge. This ayah in particular is referring to Mecca and the messenger mentioned in this hadith in particular is the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. We send a messenger reciting upon them our signs. Now the messenger recites the signs and mentions that the punishment shall come to them if they do not believe. And we don't destroy the nation except whilst people are oppressing themselves, meaning with their oppression they're destroyed, and their oppression being referred to is their shirk that they commit. Now these people were given wealth and good and a portion of the earthly life, but they transgressed in that regard. And it is for this reason that the Exalted One has said, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتُهَا وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبَقَى أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ أَفَمَنْ وَعَدَنَاهُ وَعْدًا حَسَنًا فَهُوَ لَاقِيهِ كَمَنْ مَتَّعْنَاهُ مَتَاعَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مَتَاعَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا ثُمَّ هُوَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنَ الْمُحْضَرِينَ وَيَوْمَ يُنَادِيهِمْ فَيَقُولُ أَيْنَ شُرَكَائِيَ الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ حَقَّ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقَوْلُ رَبَّنَا هَؤْلَاءِ الذين أغوينا أغويناهم كما غوينا تبرأنا إليك ما كانوا إيانا يعبدون وقيل دعوا شركاءكم فدعوهم فلم يستجيبوا لهم ورعوا العذاب لو أنهم كانوا يهتدون ويوم يناديهم فيقول ماذا أجبتم المرسلين 
فعميت عليهم الأنباء يومئذ فهم لا يتساءلون فأما من تاب وآمن وعمل صالحا فعسى أن يكون من المفلحين وربك يخلق ما يشاء ويختار ما كان لهم الخيرة سبحان الله وتعالى عما يشركون وربك يعلم ما تكن صدورهم وما يعلنون وهو الله لا إله إلا هو له الحمد في الأولى والآخرة وله الحكم وإليه ترجعون And what you were given of a portion and also a portion of the earthly life and its adornment but what is in the sight of Allah is better and long-lasting. Do you not use your intellect? Is it then the one who we promised him a good promise? And he will be meeting him like the one who we have given him a portion of the earthly life? Then on the day of resurrection, he'll be present and out of sorts. On the day in which he shall call them. He shall say, where are these partners of mine which you claim I have? Those who the decree of their Lord has come to be passed upon them. They are those who shall say, these ones led us astray. We led them astray just as we were led astray. And we declare ourselves innocent of them to you. And they did not used to worship us. It will be said, call these partners of yours. They shall call them, but they will not answer them. And they shall see the punishment to come. If only they had sought the guidance. On the day in which he shall call them and say, what is it that the messengers answer? O messengers that you answer. And the, the news comes to them and blinds them. On a day in which none shall ask about another. As far as whoever should repent and believe and do righteous deeds, such a one shall be safe. Your Lord who creates, he creates what he so wills and he chooses. But they have no choice in the matter. Glorified and exalted is Allah from what they associate with him. Your Lord, he knows what the contents are of their hearts and what they announce. He is a law. There is no God but him. He possesses all praise in this earthly life and the hereafter. He has the judgment and to him shall all of you be returned. Surah Al-Qasas, Ayat 70, Ayat 60 to 70. The exalted one, he says, you were given something of it, meaning of wealth and good, and a portion of the earthly life, meaning of the days that you lived. Then you passed away and your time limit expired. But what Allah has with him in reward is better and more long-lasting. Don't you use your intellect? Meaning, don't you understand that that which Allah has that is everlasting is better than that which is fleeting? Is the one who we've promised him a good promise? Now, those who were given a good promise that Allah has made, this refers to four things. The first thing that it refers to is that this ayah was sent down regarding the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and him being compared to Abu Jahl. For there is a comparison in this ayah between the one giving given the good promise 
and the one who shall be brought on that day out of sorts. The second thing that it's referring to is Ali and Hamza on one side and Abu Jahl on the other. For they are contrasted in the battle of Badr. So Ali and Hamza are on one side as believers. And Abu Jahl is on the other side as an unbeliever. Both these statements were mentioned by Mujahid from Ibn Abbas. The third statement regarding this ayah is that it's referring to the believer, firstly, and the unbeliever secondly. And this was said by Qatada. As for the fourth point, the fourth point is a com- is a comparison between Ammar ibn Yasir on one side and Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira on the second side. This was mentioned by As-Sudayy. The good promise refers to the paradise and help from Allah. The one who meets Allah in a state of goodness. As for the one who has a portion of the earthly life, meaning he's given something that will pass away and fade out soon enough. On the day of resurrection, he'll be brought out of sorts. This is where the punishment of Allah is unveiled. And this was mentioned by Qatada and Al-Mawirdi. And on a day in which he shall call them, this means that he, Allah the Exalted, is calling the idol worshippers on the day of resurrection. He will say, Where are my partners which you ascribe to me? Where are my partners which you claimed? Those who the word has been decreed, meaning those who which it is decreed for them the punishment. They are the very leaders of Astranus, the very leaders of the idol worshippers, but also the leaders of the demons. They will say, Lord, these followers, we led, we led them astray. We led them astray just as we were astray, but we seek innocence to you regarding them. For they are enemies to one another. So these are the unbelievers of the children of Adam. And they'll be told, call on your call on your partners. Seek help in your gods so that they protect you from the punishment. But they will call them and they will not answer them. They will see the punishment. If only they would have accepted the guidance. They would not have seen the punishment. And the day that he shall call them, meaning he Allah shall call the unbelievers, and he shall ask them. You didn't answer the messengers? What of my messengers? Were you blinded by the news? And so they were blinded. And they will not be able to answer one another regarding the proof that was given. They will be silent. They will not be able to ask each other in that time. They will be silent regarding the calamity of their sins. But as for the one who repented, فَأَمَّا مَنْ تَابَ As for the one who repented from Major Shirk, 
and believed, affirmed the Tawheed of Allah, and did righteous deeds, meaning carried out the obligatory acts, then he is certainly of those who are saved. Your Lord, who cre- he creates what he wills and he chooses. Meaning, these people, they made for their gods, the idol worshippers made for their gods the best of their wealth in the times of Jahiliyyah. Muqatil said, this ayah was partly sent down in Walid ibn Mughira when he said, why is the, this Qur'an not sent down on a man from one of the two great cities? In Surah Al-Zukhruf, the 43rd Surah 31. So he was thinking, why was not a messenger, why were no messengers sent according to their choice? Why was one sent who was different to us and we didn't choose him? So he, Allah, chooses all things. It's not for them that they make a choice against Allah, against Allah. But rather it is Allah that makes the choice. And he is the one that do, does as he wills. And he, Allah, knows the secrets of their hearts and what they manifest with their tongues. And he knows the kufr and the enmity that they have in their hearts. The exalted one then when he says, do they not hear the truth of what's been given? Don't they pay attention? Because he, Allah, has the praise in the earthly life and the hereafter, meaning he is praised. His sincere followers praise him in this earthly life and they shall praise him in the paradise. He has the judgment, meaning that he shall judge between the creations on the day of resurrection, where his judgment shall be carried out. The Exalted One then says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِن جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمُ اللَّيْلَ سَرْمَدًا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ إِلَهٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِضِيَاءٍ أفلا تسمعون قل أرأيتم إن جعل الله عليكم النهار سرمدا إلى يوم القيامة من إله غير الله غير الله يأتيكم بليل تسكنون فيه أفلا تبصرون وَمِنْ رَحْمَتِهِ جَعَلَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ لِتَسْكُنُوا فِيهِ وَلِتَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ وَيَوْمَ يُنَادِيهِمْ فَيَقُولُ أَيْنَ شُرَكَائِيَ الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ وَنَزَعْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ شَهِيدًا فَقُلْنَا هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ فَعَلِمُوا فَعَلِمُوا أَنَّ الْحَقَّ لِلَّهِ وَضَلَّ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَفْتَرُونَ إِنَّ قَارُونَ كَانَ مِنْ قَوْمِ مُوسَى فَبَغَى عَلَيْهِمْ وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْكُنُوزِ مَا إِنَّ مَفَاتِحَهُ لَتَنُوا بِالْعُصْبَةِ أُولِي الْقُوَّةِ أُولِي الْقُوَّةِ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ قَوْمُهُ لَا تَفْرَحْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْفَرِحِينَ وَبَتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ وَلَا تَبَغِي الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ 
ان الله لا يحب المفسدين say did you not see if allah had made upon you the night to be forever until the day of resurrection what god other than allah could bring you to have light again do you do you not hear don't you see and reflect that who is it if allah had had made and decreed for the daytime to be for all eternity until the day of resurrection what god other than allah could bring you night that you are still within don't you see and use your insight from his mercy is that he made for you the night and the day so that you might be still within and that you might seek his favor therein and so that you might thank him on the day in which he shall call them and say ain where are these partners which you claim and we will take out from every nation a witness we shall say bring your proofs and they will know that the truth is with Allah and they did falsehood and it led them astray in that which they did as for qarun he was from the people of musa and he transgressed against them we gave him of the treasures of that which he could attain a high rank and standard so that they might come to him with a great group his people said to him don't rejoice in this that you have because Allah does not love those who who rejoice in the wealth and oppression rather seek that which Allah has given you of the hereafter don't forget your portion from this earthly life and perfect just as Allah has perfected things for you do not seek corruption in the earth indeed Allah does not love those who commit corruption surah al-qasas the 28th surah ayat 71 to 77 when the exalted one has said that if he had so chosen chosen he could make the night and the day to be etern- eternal at certain points then he says do you not hear the hearing referred to in this aya afala tasma'un means don't you understand don't you accept don't you acknowledge the uniqueness and oneness of allah and when he refers to the night that you are still there within stillness means rest you are resting from the work that you did in the day don't you use your insight meaning aren't don't you understand that you are mistaken in your false ideas and your astrayness then he informs them that the night and the day are a mercy from him he says that the night he then says don't you know that you are still within it still within it means the night and that you seek of his favor therein after seeking his favor meaning seeking sustenance your daily wage and other things which occur mostly in the daytime so that you might be thankful to him meaning thank him for the favors that he gave you in the night and the day he allah then says and we brought out from every nation a witness meaning there was extracted from every nation its messenger which bore witness against them that he came with the revelation we shall say bring your proof meaning your evidence bring let them bring forward this nation that which they worship from besides me they will know that the truth is with Allah meaning that there is no god but him and that they were led astray and they have nothing in the hereafter for them and they had committed falsehood by the lies that they told referring to the idols that they had worshiped in this earthly life we then come to qarun that qarun was from the people of musa this means that he was also part of from the part of the family the extended family of nabi and musa alayhi salam and there are three statements regarding qarun One is that Qarun was a cousin of Nabi Yunus Musa alayhi salam. This was mentioned particularly he was a paternal cousin which would be the son of 
his paternal uncle. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn al-Harith, Ibrahim al nakhai and Ibn Juraj. The third, the second position is that Qarun was his maternal cousin. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas. The third position is that he was the uncle of Nabiuna Musa alayhi salam. This was said by Ibn Ishaq. As the judge has said that the name Qarun is not Arabic, so it has no root. It is a name of foreign import. Because had it been from Arabic, it could have been derived from a well-known root. But it is underivable, and thus is indicated as being a foreign import. When it lists that he committed transgression against his people, the transgression is that transgression is that he slandered Nabi Musa alayhi salam. And committed falsehood. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas. It is also mentioned that he committed kufr with Allah the Exalted and did not believe. This was said by Al-Dahaq. And he was also filled with arrogance as mentioned by Qatada and we shall see later. In addition to the fact that he wore long clothes out of arrogance that would drag along the ground. This was mentioned by Ata al Khorasani. He used to serve the Pharaoh in his court. And because of the honor that he was given in this such a job, he would transgress against the children of Israel and oppress them. This was mentioned by Al-Mawirdi. Now when the Exalted One says that what keys he was given, he transgressed in, his mafatih. The keys being referred to are the keys to the treasury. And he would open the treasury doors And go in, as mentioned by Mujahid and Qatada. Now, the keys of Qarun were of such magnificence, they were made from leather hide, and each key looked like a large finger. And he carried these on a mule. They were 60 in number.
his splendor, as mentioned by as Suday Abu Salih and Ad-Dahaq, was manifest. Keys were a proof of his wealth. Now some have said that his keys at some point became so numerous it took 40 mules to bear all of his keys because his wealth was so numerous. He had weighty wealth and power. But it was fleeting. He had a group of power among him He had 40 men that assisted him. He had 3 to 10 advisors. From among them, 15 other friends. And then another 70. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas, Al-Dahaq, Mujahid, Qatada, and Abu Salih. It was also narrated by Az-Zajjaj. The believers from his people said to him, Do not rejoice in your wealth and oppress others. Allah does not love those who rejoice in such affairs. Seek that which Allah has given you of the hereafter, meaning seek what he gave you of wealth and do good with it. Seek the abode of the hereafter, which is the paradise. So by spending it on things that Allah is pleased with, and thanking Allah for this wealth, that is from the means of seeking hereafter. And don't forget your portion from the earthly life. Meaning, working in the earthly life is for the hereafter. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, and the vast majority. In addition to this, you should give precedence to the favor and virtue and that which he has been given in place of that and seek protection and freedom in that which is halal and haram from that which is doubtful. This was mentioned by Al-Hasan al-Basri and Qatada. Close quote. Just as a minor point, often scholars will mention in fact, our teachers uh, said to us on a number of occasions, seek that which Allah has given you for the hereafter, the abode of the hereafter. And do not forget your portion. dunya. Don't forget your portion from the earthly life. Our teachers always told us that what that means is that's a warning against thinking that the signs of the end of time or following the faith that Allah has revealed means that you do nothing. So if you look at the story of the prophets, the prophets all had a livelihood. They were at least all shepherds. Nabi Yunus Isa alayhi salam just to be a shepherd was also a carpenter. The scholars that came had some type of livelihood, usually a trade of some sort. They were all something. What's happened now, especially in the in the English sphere, is people have, and to some extent, they've, because they're originally the pendulum was swung on one side for some of the Muslims, where they had forgotten about the hereafter, and they were running headlong into the earthly life and sacrificing the children on the altar of Mammon and Bacchus, they had then 
swung back from there. And after having swung back from that glorification of the earthly life, which we sometimes know of as postmodernism, they've now, the pendulum has swung to the other side, in which now they've run headlong into the hereafter and completely ignored the affairs of the earthly life. So you will meet people that will disappear for four months at a time or what have you because they've gone off to serve Allah or do what have you and the family's in a shambles and no one knows what's going on and all these other things. Because these people, as Allah said, dunya. Do not forget your portion of the earthly life. You have a mission to do. And that whatever work that you do in this earthly life can go towards what your hereafter belongs to. So one need not think that, well, because I'm a Muslim, that means, and because the signs of the end of time are coming, that means I've got to drop everything and escape into the woods. And that's the end of my life. The Prophet ﷺ, he said something, I, I believe it was the 20th hadith that I did when I was in Mahad, which is, <laughs> If the sign of the he, if the sign if the hour should come if the hour should come while you have a seedling in your hand small tree a seedling in your hand and you're able to plant it falyagrisha then go ahead and plant it what that indicates that hadith in sahih al jami's collection is that even in times of tribulation or what have you, if you, in those times of tribulation, are able to carry out some obligation, to carry out some type of trade or what have you, if you're able to do that, then do so. So, so someone doesn't say, okay, I've prayed five times a day, I'm doing this, now what I'm doing is I'm leaving off everything to do with the dunya. And they, and they totally misunderstand the expression, the dunya. They understand... People often make this um, strange dichotomy between the dunya and the alam, which is the creation. People say, I'm leaving off the dunya. And it's like they abandon like medical assistance. They abandon living among the rest of their family. They abandon everywhere. And they just go into these far off locations. And they leave off, he says, he said, he's left the dunya. He hasn't left the dunya, he's left the alam. The alam is the creation of the world around you, your family, all that stuff. Dunya is, the original linguistic root of the dunya is when a branch or something is near enough or close to you and you keep reaching out, trying to grab it, and you still cannot reach it, even though you keep coming close to it. The dunya are those blameworthy things. Now, al hayat dunya the earthly life, is from the alam. But just the dunya by itself, the dunya we things are those blameworthy things where you have transgressed, you're at an imbalance. So you have fallen into hubul mal, where you're loving money, and you've fallen into hubul shahawat, the loving of the earthly desires. You've fallen into these things. That's dunya when you talk about a person being dunya. That's the dunya. But people have made this distinction that, oh no, the dunya, uh, it means that if I'm a Muslim and I pray five times a day, then that means that I have to leave off whatever has to do with this life. And you'll find people get caught in this dichotomy. So someone will see someone praying five times a day or what have you, or they'll see them, they'll see someone dressed like I am sometimes and they'll tell them that, oh, well, if you do that, then you just can't live because this whole life is haram or this whole place is haram or what have you. And you have to live. And that is one of, the most asinine and also juvenile ways of viewing the revealed law and deen. Allah has told you himself in the Quran, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Now the fact that Qarun, who was obsessed with stacking up earthly wealth, was told, don't forget your portion from the dunya, it can't mean what some people take it to mean. It must mean, according to what these scholars of commentary are referring to, that don't forget that the earth, the work that you're doing in your earthly life is also for the hereafter. So the good work that you do as a fireman or what have you, Allah writes that down as reward. Those things go towards reward. Some people think that, well, because I pray and fast and do other things, 
I mustn't be associated with the kafir. I must, I must break ranks. I must leave the kafir. I must never know them. And I must live in a world that is sanitized and is free from the kafir. Just as much as people now have these antibacterial soaps everywhere and it's unsanitary and oh no, it's, it's an open field where we're going to be camping in and that's not health and safety. That same behavior people have tried to have in the life that they're living where they're saying, I have to sanitize my life. There can't be unbelievers. There can't be this. There can't be that. But the Prophet ﷺ himself tells us in Hadith and Sahih al-Jami'ah, better is the one who mix among, mixes among the people and bears their, and bears their difficulties than the one that isolates himself. Why? Because the one that mixes among the people and bears their difficulties is able to bear their difficulties and get through the tribulation and the coming of the Dajjal which if we live to see that time the false messiah we will live to be in it and we'll be mixed somewhere within the system we'll be in the sauce somewhere but those who are suffering and going through difficulty fleeing from the tribulation of the false messiah all these other things are better than the person that has cut himself off and gone to another place why? because that person cut him, cause that has cut himself off and gone to another place produces anomalies. And this is where you sometimes get cults from. Let me give you a very quick example before moving on. <clears throat> there were a group of people in the early 1950s. One of them was Mustafa al-Budali. He wanted to keep himself pure, to avoid the dunya and the earthly life. So he fled to the mountains of Algeria, the Atlas Mountains, kept himself pure, away from the dunya, away from the, tri the tribulations and fitin. After which time he began to write a little bit of things here and there, pamphlets, booklets. And as you saw, he was revving towards the logical conclusion of what he had done. And he started to say that the Algerians by and large are pagans and the Mushrikeen and they're not to be trusted. That literature and those booklets then spreads to Egypt, which for the past hundred years has been the capital city of terrorism. A man in Egypt runs across this piece of literature and he starts to take on this literature. This man's name is Ali Rida. Ali Rida writes his literature Al Khilafa, in which he has reestablished the Khilafa, and yes, the Khalifa is him. He flees from the city, calls the Egyptian people unbelievers into the countryside. His literature and texts influence another man, another Egyptian, coming from the village area of Asyut, against the Imam's permission, against his father's advice, he goes and gets involved in this text and literature. This young man's name is Shukri Mustafa Abdul Al. He founds Jamaat al Muslimin, the Jamaat of the Muslims. But it's also known as Jamaat al Takfir wa Hijra because. The first you recognize the kufr in the society around you and you label it for what it is. This is kufr. These people are kufar. And then the hijra because you flee from it. So he flees into the countryside, declares himself the Mahdi, says that he can't die until he reaches more than 50 years of age and he completes his mission. In 1977, he wasn't 50, he was executed by firing squad after decapitating Sheikh Muhammad Uthman al Dhahabi, one of the great scholars of tafsir of the uh, last hundred years, he decapitates him, cuts his head and limbs off. Now, whether the stories of cannibalism are true, I don't know. But they did decapitate this imam. And you can read the documents, which I think have been translated, on the trial of Shukri Mustafa Abdul Al, or the trial of the leader of Jamaat al Takfir wal Hijra. This is what happens when you decide to cut yourself off from the world. If you want further details on this, well, then you can visit your local monastery. You can visit your Benedictine monks, your Cistercians. You can look at the almost mile-wide paperwork of court cases involving celibate priests who've cut themselves off from the world who have molested those who are under their care. This is what happens when you cut yourself off from the world. 
you build a big madrasa on top of the mountains and you have it as a boys only school or a girls only school and you live cut off from the dunya we'll only study we'll only study the sciences of islam and we'll remain pure the super muslims the master race will remain by ourselves so then you hear cases of uh, homosexual coplings and encounters or lesbian encounters why because you've cut yourself off from the earthly life and tried to stay super pure every group that does that has one thing in common first they fail the second thing that they have in common is they ultimately wind up condemning all those around them and either killing them or killing themselves in despair i.e jim jones cult heaven's gate cult All of them started off by saying that everyone around them was evil, cutting themselves off, and then ultimately they take their own lives or the lives of those around them. This is what happens when you cut yourself off. Now, I'm not saying to run headlong, but I'm saying the pendulum is swinging in two extremes. Some people swing the pendulum to the left, in which case they've run headlong so far into their earthly life that for them, the hereafter is just a fleeting thought. The other extreme is those that have run so headlong into the hereafter, you can't find them. And they're acting as if they're already past the day of judgment. They're in the hereafter. As far as they're concerned, they're in the Jannah, and you're not invited. Your name's not on the door. Now, that is also an extreme, because neither of those groups is correct. Whether it's the man that's working at Wall Street and cares nothing about his family or anyone else and says they'll appreciate it when they get older and they see all the wealth that I've amassed and how I've made it possible to live a comfortable life. Or the man who's wearing the burlap robe with the, with the bald spot shaved in his head and he's living in the mountains and he's doing seven hours of dhikr every day or he's reciting the Vespers. Both of those are extremes. And neither of them are connected to this. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said likely, Said, said very clearly to us that whoever abandons my sunnah is not from my ummah. And so we must understand that we have an obligation that we live by the standard that Allah has given. Right? So, inshallah, what we will do is we will pause here because it is time for Salat Maghrib. We will stop here. Inshallah, we'll come back for Salat, from Salat Maghrib. أقول قبل هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم استغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم حميد رحيم ولا إله إلا الله بسم الله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد وبعد إن شاء الله we will move forward from where we left off at before we took our break for Salat al-Maghrib. The Imam, rahimahullah, he says, <clears throat> quote, As for the ayah, where the exalted one said, and do excellence, just as Allah has done excellence to you. This is referring to, according to al-Mawirdi, that you give whatever you have just as he Allah increased you according to your need and that you give others in excellence it also means in that which Allah has made compulsory for you to do perfect it to the best of your ability in carrying it out and also that in whatever thing he Exalted be he has made halal for you that you seek that halal just as he's made it halal for you to the best of your ability. The exalted one is then said from there. قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوتِيتُمْ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي أَوَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدَ أَهْلَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ مَنْ هُوَ أَشَدُّ مِنْ مَنْ هُوَ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُ قُوَّةً وَأَكْثَرُ جَمْعًا وَلَا يُسْأَلُ عَنْ ظُنُوبِهِمُ الْمُجَرِمُونَ 
فَخَرَجَ عَلَى قَوْمِهِ فِي زِينَتِهِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا يَا لَيْتَ لَنَا مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ قَارُونُ إِنَّهُ إِنَّهُ لَذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ وقال الذين أوتوا العلم ويلكم ثواب الله خير لمن آمن وعمل صالحا ويلقاها إلا الصابرون فخسفنا به وبداره الأرض فما كان له من فئة ينصرونه ينصرونه من دون الله وما كان من المنتصرين وأصبح الذين تمنوا ما كانه بالأمس يقولون ويك أن الله يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء من عباده ويقدر لولا أمن الله علينا لخسف بنا ويك أنه لا يفلح الكافرون تلك الدار الآخرة نجعلها للذين لا يريدون علوا في الأرض ولا فسادا والعاقبة للمتقين من جاء بالحسنة فله خير منها وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا يُجَزَى الَّذِينَ عَمِلُوا السَّيِّئَاتِ إِلَّا مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ إِنَّ الَّذِي فَرَضَ عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لَرَادُّوكَ إِلَى مَعَادٍ قل رب أعلم من جاء بالهدى ومن هو في ضلال مبين وما كنت ترجو أن يلقى إليك الكتاب إلا رحمة من ربك فلا تكونن ظهيرا للكافرين ولا يصدنك عن آيات الله بعد إذ أنزلت إليك ودع إلى ربك ولا تكونن من المشركين ولا تدع مع الله إلها آخر لا إله إلا هو كلنا كل شيء هالك إلا وجهه له الحكم وإليه ترجعون. He said, indeed, I have given it according to the knowledge I have and possess. Did he not know that Allah has already destroyed from before him generations who were greater than him in strength and larger in number? In fact, he shall not be asked regarding the sins of those criminal people. He came out to his people in his finery. Those who sought the earthly life said, Oh, I wish for us that we had the likeness of what Harun was given. Look at how much splendor he has. Those who were given knowledge said, Woe be to you. The reward of Allah is better for whoever believes and does righteous deeds. And no one will be able to surpass and meet the good day except those who are patient. So we overtook them and seized them as well as his house But when the earth swallowed them up. And of the group that was with him, none of them helped him from besides Allah. And there was no way for them to seek help. Those who had sought his place came out saying, 
Woe be the matter. Indeed, Allah, he spreads out his sustenance to who he wills from his slaves and he's able. Had it not been for the case that we had seen this sign and how Allah had showed benefaction and beneficence to us, we could have been taken up, taken up with him as well. Woe be to those because the unbelievers never prosper. That is the hereafter. We make it for those who do not seek to be exalted in the earth, nor corruption. And the end result is always for those who are pious. Whoever came with a good deed, then he has better than it. Whoever came with an evil deed, then he is rewarded like those who do evil deeds, except the case that they will only receive the reward of what they've done and nothing more in their evil deeds. The one, indeed, the one who is declared and ordained for you the Qur'an has said that your return shall be to the hereafter. Say, Lord, my Lord knows best whoever comes with the guidance and whoever is astray. You should not hope that shall come to you any book or any means other than by mercy from your Lord. Don't make yourself to be a helper to those who are unbelievers. And don't allow yourself to be distracted from the signs of Allah after it's been sent down to you. Call to the way of your Lord and don't be from those who associate partners. Do not call on another God with Allah. There is no God but him. Everything shall be destroyed except his face. He has the judgment and to him shall return every one. Surah Al-Qasas, the 28th Surah, Ayat 78 to 88. The Exalted One, when he mentions, I only gave him the wealth on my knowledge, meaning the knowledge of what would be done, how it would be, how it would be done, how it would be taken care of. There is a narration from as the judge who had said, those who claim that this ayah refers to alchemy regarding transforming the qualities of things to other qualities, that is false. This ayah cannot be used as a proof of that. Alchemy itself is false with no reality for it. The second thing is on knowledge that Allah knows that he's pleased with what he knows and the best of what Allah knows because Allah gives the virtue of his knowledge to who he wills. People were given knowledge sometimes in the past for what they knew but Qarun claimed that he was given his knowledge because of what he knew of the Torah, even though he was an unbeliever. He also claimed to have knowledge because of the fact that he had many different means of earning through trickery and deceit. Doesn't he know, meaning Qarun, that Allah has destroyed by his punishment from before him many nations in this earthly life because they denied their messengers? And these nations were greater than him in power, meaning in wealth and strength, and group. But he shall not be asked about their sins, because you'll not be asked to know about those who came before you. And likewise, the angels know the oppressors by their names, but they shall not be asked about their sins. Unbelievers enter the fire without reckoning, and they're punished. And they won't be asked about their sins. When Qarun came out, he came out to his people in his finery. Al Hassan al Basri said, in fine red clothing and yellow gold brocade. Ikrimah said, in clothes of saffron. And Wahhab ibn Munabbih says, it mentions he came out to his people which refers to he may have been riding on something which at that time would have been a mule of beautiful colors with a red saddle with purple undercoat and 4,000 fighters and 300 coats of armor with different displays of jewelry on them with white mules 
and he possessed great wealth. When the people said, oh, if only we'd been given what he was given, what Qarun was given, great wealth, meaning a luscious portion of this earthly life. But those who were given knowledge, Ibn Abbas said, these are the scholars of the children of Israel. Those who were given knowledge that Allah promised them of the hereafter. They knew what was the truth and not to look after earthly things. They said, woe be to you. The reward of Allah in his sight is better for the one who believes than that which Qarun was given. And let us not understand anything from the righteous deeds that we do other than we accept the reward from Allah for our patience. And that the reward of Allah is better. Then Allah said, And we seized Qarun and his house. A portion of the earth came and seized him. So when Qarun was brought out and commanded to do wickedness against Nabi Musa alayhi salam and he slandered him, as we already mentioned in Surah Al-Qasas, Ayah 76, Nabi Musa alayhi salam was angered by this display of disobedience. And he made dua against him. And Allah revealed to him, Indeed, I am about to command the earth that it might swallow him up. Nabi Musa alayhi salam said, Earth, take him in whole. And so the earth swallowed him. Even his great chair of magnificence that he sat on. When some of the people saw this, they asked for mercy to be given to him and said, Oh, if only we had that type of wealth. When Nabi Musa alayhi salam commanded the earth to finish the swallowing up of Qarun, until nothing remained but his feet and the foundations of his property. He supplicated again until that was consumed. Allah then said to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, Musa, I have given what you have called for by my might and my majesty. Had he supplicated with me and repented, I would have saved him. But he did not. The earth coming up and swallowing him up had to do according to Ibn Abbas that a sinkhole came. And the sinkhole in the earth swallowed him up and he shall remain in that condition until the time where he shall be resurrected. Some of the children of Israel said, Nabi Musa only asked for him to be destroyed to take his wealth and his abode. But Allah had caused his wealth and his abode to be swallowed up thereafter. No group was able to help him after, meaning they could not stop the punishment of Allah. There was no one he could refer back to. There was no one that he could seek assistance from. But some of the people repented and said, had it not been for us repenting, that could have been us. The Khasaf Abina, we would have been swallowed up by the earth. So they repented of this. Then Allah said, Had it not been from the favor and munific- munificence of Allah upon us, we would have been swallowed up, meaning His mercy, His pardon, and the fact that they had Iman. So the hereafter, the paradise, is what we've made for those who do not seek to be exalted in the earth. Meaning to go astray, to seek special honors, or might, or oppression, or idolatry, or that others should idolize them. Or to exalt themselves and believe themselves too good to have iman. All of this was mentioned by Sa'id ibn Jubayr, al-Hasan al-Basri, al-Dahaq, Yahya ibn Salam, and Muqatir. Also, they should not be seeking any corruption to do deeds of disobedience or calling on other than Allah in worship, as said by Ikrimah ibn Asa'ib. And the end result is always for the believers, and this is a praise that Allah has given them. Whoever came with a good deed shall have better than it. This was explained in Surah al Naml, Ayah 89. And those who do those who do evil deeds. There's no reward for those who do evil deeds, who associate partners with Allah, except that which they did. 
and the end result of those who commit idolatry, their reward is the great fire. The one who ordained for you the Qur'an has told you that you will return to the end. Muqatil said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came out from the cave that he had been in one day hiding on the way to making Hijrah to Medina. And he wandered off the path where he had normally stayed on because he was concerned some people might be looking for him. Whereas when he was safe, he returned along and came down to a section between Mecca and Medina and followed along the path towards Mecca. And when he saw that, he remembered his own birth from all the way up until that time. The angel Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said, Are you thinking of your land and your birth and what you've gone through up until now? He said, Yes, I am. He said, Indeed, Allah the Exalted said, The one who ordained for you the Qur'an shall certainly return you to your abode. And this was sent down at that point. So the one who told you to act by the Qur'an, the one who gave you the Qur'an, the one who sent down upon you the Qur'an, shall return you to your abode, meaning to Mecca. But also the Ma'ad is also a reference to the paradise as well. So returning them to the abode is great indeed. Now the question that may arise, the word ma'ad means you shall be returned to the abode. Someone could say, just a moment, how could he be returning to the abode, be returning to it, when the paradise on the day of resurrection shall be for those that go in, how can he be returning to something? The answer to the question is from three standpoints. One is that his father is Nabi Adam alayhi salam who was in the paradise. And then he was brought out of the paradise. He was expelled. And because he is one of the sons of Adam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was expelled with him. So when he enters in, it is as if he is returning, as his father will return. The second answer to this question is that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, entered the paradise on the night journey. So when he enters it on the day of resurrection, he'll be returning therein. So there is no contradiction here. The third is that the Arabs always say that a matter returns to such and such and such and such, if it shall be forever, meaning that your return back to something means that you're going to something better, that it's the best thing for you. And then when the exalted one says, Wa ilallahi turja'ul umur, and to Allah all affairs return. Surah Al Baqarah, the second surah, ayah 210. But also it discusses returning to death because everyone must die, returning to the day of resurrection. All of these things are intended. And when the unbelievers said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was astray, he said, My Lord, you know best regarding who comes with the guidance and who is in astrayness. So, he, Allah, knows who the Prophet is and who it's not. And he, Allah, says that you received the book. وَمَا كُنْتَ تَرْجُوا أَنْ يُلْقَى إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ you didn't ask to be a prophet and that the Qur'an be revealed to you. This was a mercy from your Lord that was given unto you. So don't be a helpmate or an assister to the unbelievers in their religion. So if they should try to call him to the religion of their fathers, he should stay away from them. So that they, they don't manifest it. If they should call for a compromise, he shouldn't follow it. Everything shall be destroyed except for his continence. Meaning except for him. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas 
of the Hawk and Abu Ubaidah. He has the judgment because he will separate and divide and sort between all the creations on the day of resurrection. And to him shall all things return. We then come to the next surah after this, which is Surah Al-Ankabut. Now this surah, it was mentioned by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu that this surah is Meccan. And this is also the statement of Al-Hasan al-Basri, Qatada, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, Jabir ibn Zayd, and Muqati. Now from the beginning of it, up until Ayah 10, it was revealed in Mecca. But the ending portions were in Medina. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas. Now this surah starts with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alif Lam Mim Ahasiban Nasu Ayutraku Ayakulu Amen Nawahum La Yuftanun Wala Koda Fatan Lavina Mirobalihim فَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ أَنْ يَسْبِقُونَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ لَآتِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the compassionate. Alif la mim. Do the people think that they'll be left alone to say we believe and not be tested? Already we had tested those from before them. So that, indeed, so that way indeed Allah knows those who are truthful and he also knows the liars. Or do those who do sins believe that they will proceed to us and do as they will? Evil is that which they judge. Whoever hopes with a meeting of Allah, meeting with Allah, then indeed, Allah brings on that meeting. He is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Whoever strives in that cause, then indeed, he strives for himself. Indeed, Allah is sufficient and free of all wants from all the creation. Surah Al-Ankabut, the 29th Surah, Ayat 1 to 6. The Exalted One has said, in the beginning, Alif Lam Mim, do the people believe they will be left? The reason this eye was sent down was there were three main incidents that brought it about. One is the Hijrah. When the people were commanded to do Hijrah, the Muslims wrote to their brothers in Mecca that they would not accept their Islam until they made Hijrah. When the Muslims of Mecca sought to make Hijrah to Medina, the unbelievers detained them and took them back. Due to this, Allah Mighty and Majestic revealed the beginning, the first ten ayat of this surah. The Muslims wrote to those in Mecca regarding what was sent down to them. They said, We shall march out 
And if anyone follows us, we shall fight him. They moved out to leave, but the idol worshippers followed the Muslims desiring to leave. Those Muslims that said they would fight them kept their promise and fought them. Some were killed. Some were safe. Allah sent down after that event regarding these people. ثُمَّ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لِلَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا فُتِنُوا Then, your Lord, to those who made the hijrah after they had been tested. This ayah to the end was revealed. Surah Al-Nahl, the 16th Surah 110. This is what was mentioned by Al-Hasan and Al-Sha'bi. A second incident is that it was sent down regarding Ammar ibn Yasin when he was tortured for the sake of Allah. This was mentioned by Abdullah ibn Ubaid ibn Umayr. This ayah was also sent down regarding Mahja' Mahja' the freed slave of Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was killed at Badr. His parents and his wife wept over him. But Allah gave solace to Mihja' by sending down this ayah about him. Now when Allah says, do those, do those people think, Ibn Abbas who said, those people means those who believe in Mecca, like Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'a, Ammar ibn Yasir, and Salama ibn Hashim and others. Do those people think? Do the people think they will be left to say we believe and then not be tested? Will they just say we're believers only and not be tested? So that the reality of their iman might be manifested. So these people, he Allah is asking them, do you think that you won't be tested? So that the truthfulness of your iman might be showed from those who lie? They might be tested in themselves by being killed or tortured? Or tested by the commands and prohibitions that Allah gives? We tested, already we tested those who came before them, meaning they were tested and those who were truthful were found out. Allah knows. Law shall manifest those who are truthful in their faith at the time of trials when they're patient in what he ordained. He shall know the liars when their faith, when they doubt in the time of difficulty that they go astray. He shall manifest all this now he knew all this from before, but he manifested in front of the rest of his creation so that it's well known to everyone. And everyone sees it. Do those who do sins, meaning major shirk, think that they will come to us evil as that which they judge for themselves, thinking that they are safe? Ibn Abbas who said, this ayah is in regards to Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira, Abu Jahl, and Al-As ibn Hashim and others. Whoever hopes for the meeting with Allah, now we've already explained the meeting of Allah in Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th surah. Someone may refer back to that for further details. Then indeed Allah brings about that meeting, meaning the resurrection. Let him know that for that day. Let him prepare. He is all hearing of what they say and all knowing of what they do. Whoever strives is for himself, meaning the reward goes back to him. For Allah doesn't need any reward for anyone. Then the exalted one, he says after this, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُكَفِّرَنَّ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ وَلَنَجَزِيَنَّهُمْ أَحْسَنَ الَّذِي كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ 
ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حسنا وإن جاهداك لتشرك بي ما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لندخلنهم في الصالحين ومن الناس من يقول آمنا بالله فإذا أوذي في الله فإذا أوذي في الله جعل فتنة الناس كعذاب الله كعذاب الله لئن جاء نصر من ربك من ربك ليقولن إنا كنا معكم أوليس الله بأعلم بما في صدور العالمين ولا يعلمن الله الذين آمنوا ولا يعلمن المنافقين وقال الذين كفروا للذين آمنوا اتبعوا سبيلنا ولا نحمل خطاياكم ولا نحمل خطاياكم وما هم بحاملين من خطاياهم من شيء إنهم لكاذبون ولا يحملون أثقالهم وأثقالا مع أثقالهم ولا يسألون يوم القيامة عما كانوا يفترون ولقد أرسلنا نوحا إلى قومه فلبث فيهم ألف سنة ألف سنة إلا خمسين عاما فأخذهم الطوفان وهم ظالمون those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will expiate from them their sins. We shall reward them with the best of that which they used to do. We have already advised the human being regarding his parents to be good to them. But if they should fight against you in order that you might associate with me that which you have no likeness or knowledge of, then do not obey them in that regard. To me is your return and I will inform you of that which you used to do. Those who believe and do righteous deeds shall be entered among those who are the pious and righteous. For among humanity is who says we believe in Allah. And when they're tested in Allah, it becomes a tribulation for the people like the punishment of Allah. But if there should come a help from their Lord, then they would have said, indeed, we are with you. Is it not the case that Allah knows regarding what's in the heart and what's in the marrow of the creations in total? So that Allah will know those who believe and those who are hypocrites. Those who reject faith say to those who believe, follow our way. We will bear your difficulties, but they won't bear their difficulties at all. They're liars. And if they were to bear their difficulties and difficulties with their difficulties, they shall certainly be asked on the day of resurrection regarding that which they lied about. Already we sent Nuh to his people. He was among them for a thousand years, subtracted by 50. And then those people were overtaken with the flood. So then he overtook them with the flood, and they were oppressors. Surah Ankabut, the 29th Surah, Ayat 7 to 14. The Exalted One, when he says, Who is the one who hopes for the meeting with Allah? Then And then right after that saying, whoever strives, strives for his own self, and that he shall indeed expiate from those who believe and do righteous deeds from them their sins. So it shall be taken away, and they shall be rewarded with the best of what they did, the best of their deeds when they obeyed him. And the human being has been advised regarding his parents to show goodness, to show goodness. So 
This has been mentioned that this ayah was sent down. And when this ayah was sent down, it's been narrated by Uthman al Nahdi from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas who said that when this ayah was sent down, I was a man who was good to his mother. When I became Muslim, she said, Sa'ad, what is this religion which is new that's come about that you're now following? You're following some man. And if you will not leave this religion, I will not eat nor drink until I die. And then I will be led astray. And it was said, oh, this one killed his own mother. I said, mother, don't do it. I will not abandon my religion for anything. She said, then I will stay one day and one night without eating. And so the morning came. And she had kept her word. And she stayed another day and a night without eating. When I saw that, I said, You know by Allah, O mother, if you had 100 lives and each one went time after time, I would not leave this religion for anything. So go ahead and eat if you want, or don't eat. It makes no difference to me. When she realized that, she started eating. And this ayah was sent down. This ayah was also mentioned in conjunction with the incident of Ayash ibn Abi Rabi'ah. When his mother called for him and she lied through subterfuge and he was taken back. The discussion around this ayah has also been mentioned in conjunction with another ayah in Surah Luqman, 34th Surah Ayah 15. The 24th Surah Ayah 15. And in Surah Al-Ahqaf, the 46th Surah Ayah 15. Az-Zajjaj has mentioned this as well. So that the human being has been told to do goodness to his parents and to do righteousness. But if they should fight against you, to associate with me that which you have no knowledge of, to commit idolatry, to make a partner with him that you know nothing of, it's not for anyone at all to obey in that matter. Those who believe, he Allah says, we shall certainly enter among the pious, meaning among the pious ranks in the paradise. And from the people is whoever says we believe in Allah. So some people, some believers, those who they left out when the unbelief when the idol worshippers forced them on the day of Badr. Some of them forced them to go out. They said, You're going out to the battlefield. And some of those people that were pushed apostated. Still, this ayah was also sent down those who believe with their tongues. But when they're given some test by Allah or some difficulty in themselves, in their wealth, then all of a sudden they become mournful. Still more so, this also refers to the hypocrites in, Mac in, uh, hypocrites in Medina who, believe, who believed but did not believe. And when some difficulty came to them, they returned to their idolatry. Then you have Ayash ibn Abi Rabi'a who had become Muslim and feared for himself and his people and, his, and feared for himself, his family, his people. He left from Mecca trying to flee to Al-Medina. This was before the Messenger of Allah وسلم, had gone to Medina. His mother became scared and said to his brothers, Abu Jahl and Al-Harith ibn Hisham, to go get him. And they said, your mother won't eat and drink until you come back. So when they came out seeking him and they found him, they lied to him. And he ultimately wound up coming back. And he suffered greatly. And this is an example of what occurs. But when they suffer in the sake of Allah, or they suffer torture because of their faith, it becomes a tribulation for them in this earthly life. Just like the punishment of Allah in the hereafter is severe. It's necessary for the believer that he's patient with difficulties in Allah, hoping for Allah's reward and His sanctification. If there comes help from your Lord, meaning a governed place for the believers, then let them say, they would have said, meaning the hypocrites to the believers, ah, now we're with you because you have something. But Allah knows of their lies. Is it not that Allah knows what's in the very, very, very marrow of those 
who are his creations, meaning he knows who believes and who has nifaq. We've explained this ayah and what comes in the beginning of the surah. Those who reject faith say to those who believe, follow our way, meaning our religion. This is the statement of the idol-worshipping Quraysh to those who believe from the people of Mecca. They said to them, we will not be resurrected, nor will you. So follow us. If there's anything to follow, then it's our way. We'll bear whatever difficulties you have. We'll bear whatever struggles that you struggle with. We will take it. We will bear it. But Allah said that these people are liars. They can bear nothing of the matter. Indeed, if they were to bear their own sins, sins with their sins, they couldn't do it. But Allah says about them, لَيَحْمِلُوا أَوْزَارَهُمْ كَامِلَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَمِنْ أَوْزَارِ الَّذِينَ يُضِلُّونَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ They will actually bear their own sins completely on the day of resurrection, and even some of the sins of those who they led astray without knowledge. Surah Al-Nahl, the 16th Surah, Ayah 25. And they shall be asked on the day of resurrection regarding that which they used to fabricate and lie against Allah regarding. They used to say that they could bear people's sins. And they will be found out. We sent Nuh to his people. Now and this is a comforting story, a narrative to the Prophet wasallam, because he's being taught that the prophets from before him were rejected and denied. And it also shows there's a great penalty for whoever stays upon idolatry. Even if they were lazy in it. The people of Nuh were the most in idolatry and the first to carry it out. And then they were taken. He remained among them for a thousand years, less 50. Now, some have said that Nabi Nuh was sent to them as a messenger after 40 years and lived among his people for a thousand years, less 50, calling them to the faith. And after the flood, he lived another 60 years. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas. So this would mean that he was 40. He stayed for 950 years, which is 990. And then he lived another 60 years after, which is 1050. The second understanding is that he was sent... He remained among his people for a thousand years less 50, which is 950 years. Then he lived another 70 years after that. So his age was 1,020 years. This was said by Ka'b al-Ahbar. <clears throat> Third statement is that he was sent among his people... And he was 350 years old. And he remained among them for a thousand years left, less 50. Then he lived after that another 350 years. This was said by Aun ibn Abi Shidad. Fourth understanding is that he lived among them before he called them 350 years. And then he called them for 300 years, which is 650. And he lived after the flood for another 350, which is a thousand years. As said by Qatada. Wahab ibn Munabbih said he was sent when he was 50 years of age. A fifth opinion is that this ayah makes clear that the time of his age, his, his complete age, was 950 years, then he died. And this is the position of Al-Mawirdi. Now, someone might say, what's the benefit in Allah saying a thousand years less 50? Why not just say 950? The answer to this question is that the intent is to show 
the lengthy amount of time. And mentioning a thousand years means coming close to the perfection, to the end of something. Because the greater a number has close to a thousand, the closer it is to perfection. So whenever the Arabs, whenever it's used in Arabic, an expression of exceptionalism, except or other than or besides, that is used to emphasize that you should know about that thing more. You should study about it more. And you should understand. Like if you said, all of your brothers came to visit me except Zaid. Particular emphasis is given on the fact that the group came, but Zaid was missing. Or if half of something, I have this, I have only half. This emphasizes that you need to know about that thing. You need to study about it. And then they were overtaken with the flood. Now the flood, when it says, tufan, meaning that they were killed instantly by the flood. This is narrated by Aisha from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when she said, this ayah, they were taken by the flood, meaning they were killed instantly by the waters of the flood, as Tabarani is mentioned. The second thing that they were taken by the flood means when they were rained on. The excessive rain killed them before the flood waters rose. This is the position said by Ibn Abbas, Sa'id ibn Jubayr, Qatada. And Ibn Qutaybah has said, it is the strong rain that killed them first. A third position is that it was the drowning that killed them. This was said by Abdahak. As the judge has said, the flood of everything, whether it was a little bit or a lot, was wiped out. Tufan means when most of something is submerged, whereas drowning is where the totality of it is. And they were oppressors. Ibn Abbas said, unbelievers. Close quote. Now before ending this out, because we've reached our maximum, alhamdulillah, I just want to mention that there is a difference of opinion, not just in the years of Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, but regarding the flood. The first opinion, which is the preponderant and overwhelming majority, is that the flood was global. That is the overwhelming majority. The minority opinion is that the flood was local. The flood was local only to the area of Nabi Nuh alayhi salam and only killed those people. Those who say that it was global and those who say it was local have around 30 evidences each side. But most of their evidences are the same. I would say this. The greatest stumbling block to someone holding the position that the flood was local. I'm not going to say either way what I'm holding on to. I would say the greatest stumbling block that someone has to saying that the flood was local. Besides their almost sleight of hand statement when you ask them, do you believe the flood was global? They say, I believe it was universal. Do you mean that the flood was global? I believe it was universal. Just say you believe it was local. Besides the sleight of hand, shu'bad, the card trick that they do, I'd say that the greatest difficulty stumbling block that they have is the fact that they have to fall into sort of a hole regarding the fact that you go back 9,000 years, no matter where you dig archaeologically, and you find mud. Packed in thick mud. And then when you dig past that, you start finding pottery and artifacts again. 
No matter where you go on earth, it doesn't matter where you go. I've dug in Oregon, I've dug in Canada, I've dug in Mexico. I've done a little bit in London. No matter where you go, you find the same thing. 9,000 years worth of deposited sand. 9,000 years worth of deposited soil. 9,000 years uh, worth of sedimentary layers with their fossils. And then you find mud. Now, that is contiguous globally. I can say from my standpoint, what I've noticed in Canada, the United States and Mexico, that that's the case. And to a degree in London, I can say that. Other people have said it's contiguous, it's, it is contiguous globally. They're going to have to account for that. The second thing they're going to have to account for is the Himalayan mountains, Mount Everest, having giant oysters on the top of Mount Everest and the rest of the Himalayan mountains. Now, oysters, as we know, can't walk and they don't roll themselves. But they're surrounded by mud and they're in the closed position. When oysters die, they open. Giant oysters in the closed position would mean they were hit suddenly by something that killed them instantly. This also points to the fact then that the subcontinent India did not collide with Asia as is some of the received belief. But rather that the Himalayan mountains were part of the ocean floor that rose suddenly and violently. Bringing the oysters, the giant oysters, up above the ocean floor in thousands of feet into the air, killing them almost immediately. Because the whole point of what a fossil is, is an organism that's killed suddenly and submerged in mud or dirt. I would say that's the greatest stumbling block for someone holding the local flood position. If someone does, like I said, it's something, it's a minority position, it's accepted. I'm not going to argue with you. But I just say they still have yet to resolve the mud issue, the contiguous mud layers, and explaining plate tectonics, seafloor spreading, and the fact that a large portion of mountains throughout the world are not the result of plate tectonics or collisions of plates coming together, but are a result of massive sections of the seafloor coming above land where we can find the marine life suspended on the tops of these mountains in the closed position or in strange positions that we know they would not do if they died in a normal habitat. This is a stumbling block for them. And it's a stumbling block for the evolutionist. Now I'll say this very quickly. Some slaves of Allah have not wanted to face evolutionists head on. So, some of what we would call the more brilliant or intellectual minds have decided they're going to go with a local flood because they feel it gives them a little bit of a safer padded way than having to confront the issue of the evolutionists and a global flood. But still, if you hold a local flood position, they're still going to be after you because then they're going to want you to explain it. A local flood and how it got locally to where it was. Where was he when it happened? Then you have to explain where Nabi Anu Ali he said I was. Where was the local flood? Then you have to put a date on it. If you put a date on that flood and they look in the Telamarna sedimentary layers and they don't find it, your goose is cooked. Your goose is cooked. These are the only things I'd say that if someone holds a local position, they've got to answer. Now, I'm not saying the answer is not there. I'm saying it's their greatest stumbling block. I haven't read heavily into the local position enough regarding the challenges that have been presented to it by some other people to give a good defense of it. Other than to say that it is there, but to say that it does represent a very big difficulty that they're going to have to fight for the opinion that the earth underwent a local flood in the time of Nabi Nuh alayhi salam. Now, in closing this then, 
In closing this off, we finally come to the end of our portion where someone may say, well, wait a minute. You've got these dates in here, people 950 years, 1,000 years. Let's just say, let's just go with the 950. How on earth do you account for someone living 950 years? It's just not possible. It doesn't make any sense. There's no way that can be. That's fanciful. You guys are into spookism. That just isn't possible. You should tender your reply from three angles. Number one, the earth that we live in, in terms of the systems that are in our earth, the water cycle and other things, is not the same earth of thousands of years ago. We know this because in Idaho, Wyoming, Oregon, you can find tree stumps 50 feet around. You can also look in the bark and the oxygen plumes of those trees, no matter where you go, which gives us an idea that the oxygen level in our atmosphere was closer to 20% rather than the 2% it is now. Now listen, if you have a higher level of purity in your atmosphere, you have a higher recovery rate from injuries. Isn't that what athletes are doing now? Boxers and others, they're going into these cryogenic oxygen chambers after they train. Don't you remember the case of baby Jessica? If you have a chance to look it up, this is the early, this is the late 80s. Baby Jessica falls down a, a mine shaft and her leg was broken and twisted behind her head. It was black. When they got her out, they thought she was going to lose her leg. But a doctor, a brilliant doctor, he wept when he saw the child. He thought, let me just try one thing. They put her inside of an oxygen chamber, a pure oxygen chamber, and the circulation returned back to her leg. Now that was in 1989. Baby Jessica survived that. So a higher oxygen level means higher lifespan. So when people find crocodiles and other animals from the prehistoric period that are 100 feet long or silly silly amounts long, why is this animal so big? Well, look at the oxygen that was present. And reptiles don't stop growing the duration of their lives until something steps on them or they're killed or they're eaten. Reptiles keep growing. Reptiles do not stop growing. They don't. A reptile does not stop growing the duration of its life until it's eaten or killed. They just don't stop. So we see these examples around us. So it should be no strange feat. Isn't that that what this cryogenic freezing is about? It's about freezing people and then waiting until we found a cure for cancer or other things and then thawing them out? So you have no reason to accuse the Muslim and say that, well, the Muslim is being extreme or whatever by bringing up these three points. They have no reason to accuse the Muslim because they're freezing people to say they want to live forever. To live 950 years is nowhere near forever. It's 950 years. We're just saying people lived longer years ago. And Allah says in the Quran that he destroyed nations greater than you in power and greater in number. If we go back to ancient Egypt, is ancient Egypt more advanced or less advanced than now? It's more advanced. The evolutionary model says that everyone in the world was living in caves and ugly, ugly Neanderthal was living by himself and he had an elongated forehead and everyone in the world was like this. But you go back five, six thousand years, it's more advanced. No one, still no one can find out how the Great Pyramid was built. They still don't know how the city of Tetuan has blocks that are 212,000 tons and they have serrated edges which means they were either cut with diamond tip drills or lasers and they're perfectly slotted together they still don't know how that city was built but if you follow the evolutionary model you have to believe human beings are going from stupid simpletons to going advanced no wonder they're so depressed because for them this is as good as it gets For the Muslim, it's, we sure fell off. Hope we get back to where we used to be soon. That's what the day of resurrection is all about. Is getting back to where you were supposed to be. So, with that said, we close, inshallah, here, I say. 
أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله إن الله غفر رحيم الرحيم الرحيمين Is there any question over what we've covered so far today? Any question? Yes? Um, Sheikh, did you, uh, was I right by you saying that um, at the time of uh, Nuh alayhi salam, they were the first to start worshipping idols, is that correct? Question is regarding, in the time of Nabi Nuh alayhi salam, was this the first idolatry that was committed? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa rasulillah. This is correct. Um, there is a statement in the Sahih of Bukhari, where Ibn Abbas who he mentions that from the time of Nabi Nuh to Nabi from the time of Nabi Adam to Nabi Nuh alayhim salam everyone was upon one deen that's it there was one deen um, and is there any um, narration to uh, explain what came about the manifestation of idolatry question is regarding the reasoning and the historical evidence regarding what caused the idolatry. Alhamdulillah. Yes, in the same collection of Al-Bukhari, as well as in uh, Surah Nuh, the tafsir on Surah Nuh, uh, the 71st Surah, mentions that the people had five great teachers. When those teachers died and were buried, the shaitan came to them and kept telling them to uh, ennoble the places where they were buried and to come and visit them. When that generation of people died, the new generation then comes. Shaitan says, do you know who these were? The new generation didn't remember what the older generation remembered. And he says, do you know who these were? The people say, no. And Shaitan says, these are your gods, now worship them. And this is where it started. So, is there a question over anything else? Yes. What did you say on um, um, the three angles? Yes. Question is regarding the three angled argument regarding why Nabi Nuh uh, was 950 and older and why this should not be something seemingly far fetched. Uh, the first is uh, the oxygen levels being higher uh, and the atmosphere being different, almost like a greenhouse effect. Uh, which, if you ever look at food that's grown in a greenhouse or animals grown in that type of environment, they're larger and they're hardier. Um, the second is it shouldn't be so far-fetched because people are involved in cryogenic freezing and trying to find a way to make people live forever. So 950 is less than forever. The third reason is that the time period we're talking about and the access to food that people had and the technology that people had is different than the technology that we have now. As I said, we're only understanding, we're only beginning to understand some of the things about civil engineering and other things and starting to understand the human diet. We've only now just mapped the Neanderthal's genome. And in 1991-92, the human genome was only first mapped. Now, that enables you to really narrow down people's nutrition based upon race. And to also narrow down weapons that attack people genetically. People back then, although they might not have been engaging in genome or things like this, had a far wider understanding of themselves, the world around them. And we find this from maps of galaxies and the solar system, maps that the Egyptians have of Orion, of Andromeda, which can't be seen except with uh, equip with uh, telescopic equipment, and other things such as this. So apparently they knew something to look after themselves, to have the right diet, the right food, the right everything else. So none of that should seem far-fetched to a Muslim. Right? Is there a question or anything else? Yes. Um, in the previous surah, and you said uh, regarding everything will be destroyed um, except for the attribute called the face of Allah. Mm. Um, um, Ashuris um, translate that as the will of Allah um, and a few of their translations. Um, could you shed some light on that uh, and the permissibility and the impermissibility of the translation? Question is regarding the translation of the expression Wajahu. Everything will be destroyed except Wajahu, his face. Right, and that the Ash'aris have said that this is referring to his will. And what have the others said on this matter? Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam rasulillah. The first issue is the scholars uh, of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and those that follow him and come after say that wajah uh, is an attribute of Allah uh, and that what it's referring to means that everything will be destroyed except for him. So all things will be destroyed 
everything will be destroyed except for him, which is an evidence that a law is uncreated. A law is without beginning, without end. Uh, the Maturidis have two opinions. Some of them, Wajahu, mean, say that it means uh, Nefsahu, his essence. Uh, and some say that the eye is the same thing as what Imam Ahmed and others said, is that it's a reference to the fact that everything shall be destroyed except for him. Is there a question? Another question? Final question? Yes? No. Okay. So we'll stop here. And inshallah, when we pick up next week, we'll start from there. Subhanakullah. Wa rahmatullahi wa shatu wa la ilahi la ant. Astaghfiruka wa yatubu ilayk. Inna hu ghafur rahim wa rahmi wa rahimin. Wa la ilaha illallah. Wa salamu alaykum.